Okay, and this next question is the NHR constitutional. So I did speak to David about this before, so um, I wanted to add the, add the qualifier that I'm I'm no legal eagle, so I'm only taking what I what I read here. So there's a very positive development here. Last year, June was a court case in which Solidarity and another doctor association took the department to court to declare the certificate of need unconstitutional, and the court case was successful. And the North Gauteng High Court ruled that they are unconstitutional on six grounds. That's quite a few points, not just one or two, but, but six. Um, government did attempt to have that, that case rescinded on the embarrassing realization that they'd forgotten to file opposing papers. Um, so the, the whole case was unopposed, even though Solidarity as lawyers are adamant that the papers were served twice. Um, so the timeline on it is June 22, High Court strikes it down. Uh, this was a comment from Solidarity Peer Remarks. And just to emphasize how draconian the certificate of need intended to be, it is within the, in the powers of the Director General of the Department of Health to prescribe virtually all the medical practices activities ranging from the equipment to its human resources, even the size of the practice. I'll go further to say even the type of clinical practice you can have. It had one clause in which it said the DG could impose any condition it wishes, any condition, as broad as, as powers that clearly unconstitutional in what law needs to be constrained. Um, so struck down in June, government did not oppose the case. Sorry, I'm repeating myself a bit here. Claim papers are not received correctly. Application for recession fails and is now awaiting ratification by the Concord. So if this does get ratified by the Concord, very, very positive development because this puts a big nail in the coffin of the NHR because they won't then be able to tell doctors where they can go, what they can do, what practices they may run. I mean, you might think if you read this, it's almost like a, a case straight out of the Soviet Union in terms of central control um, of everything. Fortunately, the courts have, have, have stood, us, stood us well. Um, another legal development quite recently in the last few weeks, um, Parliament's Health Portfolio Committee is currently assessing uh, the bill, and we hear that the ANC are attempting quite to try and push this through as quickly as they can. But they've currently received conflicting advice. The state law advisor has given it the NHR bill, green bill, uh, clean bill of health, no pun. Um, but Parliament's legal unit, which advises parliaments, parliamentarians on, le on legality of law, has said no, there's a whole string of issues that they have concerns about. And one of them is the same concern that the North Gauteng High Court also found unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a strong link between the findings of that High Court ruling and Parliament's legal unit. But nonetheless, we've, we've engaged with quite a few people over the last few months, even in last year, I would say legal action against this bill is an absolute certainty if it does get passed. Okay, um, and that will come from various sources, I think. But uh, yeah, um, I think a good thing as well. Could NHR lead to a massive immigration of doctors? Um, I'm going to go again. It's certain. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> two pieces of evidence here, again from Solidarity. They did a survey a few years ago, found 43% of health workers answered yes to would they immigrate if the NHR was implemented. Uh, slightly more recently, the South African Medical Association, which represents most of the doctors in the country, there we go, 38% said yes to the same question, they would immigrate if NHR was implemented. Um, interestingly, there's still a large percentage who said they were unsure, 17%. And also interesting that 6% said they're considering immigrating, but for other reasons. So we can't afford to lose doctors. So, But I thought I'd find um, a real life case. Obviously, surveys can have biases in them. Um, let's take a real case. And I'll come back to, seems like my favorite subject these days, but Cuba. Um, so Cuba nationalized its health system a few decades ago. Um, quite a few, actually. Um, and this was in a paper titled Four, Cub Four Decades of Cuban Healthcare. Uh, the nationalization of mutual aid coops and private hospitals provoked the exodus of nearly two thirds of all medical professions. If you read the notes on it, it happened within a year of the nationalization implementing. It was all done wide scale across the 
across the board in the country. The brain drain had a significant impact on many outputs of the Cuban healthcare system. One of them was infant mortality rates. As I said earlier, it's quite a measure of institutional performance in health systems. So Cuba's mortality rate was 33 at the start of the, or the year before the nationalization took place. And within 10 years, it had risen to 46.7 per thousand births. Now, over that 10 year period, I managed to find some data. There were approximately two and a half million births over the 10 year period, which means that this change, this nationalization of Cuba's health system and the exodus of doctors caused the unnecessary deaths of 20,000 more infants than would have been had the infant mortality rate remained at 33. So there can be real life costs to this type of action, which I don't think anyone has realistically had a look at.